All right, welcome to The Explainer. Today, we're diving into a classic question from the UPSC exam. Now, this one, it looks a little intimidating at first glance, right? But trust me, it's actually built around one of the most fundamental ideas in all of economics. We're going to break this thing down step by step so you don't just memorize the answer. You actually get the logic behind it. That's what's going to help you crush it on exam day. So here it is. This is the question we're going to unpack. And when you strip away all the formal language, what is it really asking? It's basically saying, hey, if everything suddenly costs twice as much, but you also earn twice as much, why wouldn't you buy more or less stuff? See, when you put it like that, it sounds way less scary. The fancy wording is just there to test if you know the core economic principle. And I bet you already get this on an intuitive level. So let's dig in. All right, here's the game plan for today. We're gonna deconstruct the question, lock down the core concept, nail the mathematical proof, and then I'll show you exactly how to write the perfect answer. We'll even get a little inside scoop on how these things are graded. Let's get started. Okay, first up, deconstructing the question. So what's really going on here? You know, it's easy to see this and think, oh, it's a math question, but it's so much more than that. At its heart, this is testing one simple but super important idea that rational people, you and me, we make our decisions based on real value, not just the numbers we see on a price tag. And that brings us right to the core concept, which has, I gotta say, one of the coolest names in economics, the absence of money illusion. It sounds kind of magical, right? But before we even touch a single equation, let's just use a really simple story to see what it means. It'll make perfect sense, I promise. Okay, let's talk chocolate. Imagine you've got 100 bucks to spend on chocolate bars for the week, and they're $2 each. Pretty simple, right? You can buy 50 bars. Now, let's say tomorrow you wake up and boom, your chocolate budget has doubled to $200. Awesome, right? But wait, the price of a chocolate bar has also doubled to $4. So how many can you actually buy? Yep, still 50. The numbers got bigger, sure, but your real purchasing power, the actual amount of chocolate you can enjoy, hasn't changed one bit. You're not actually any richer, so why on earth would you change how many you buy? And that right there, that's it. That's the whole idea of absence of money illusion. It's this principle that rational people, we aren't fooled by just the face value of money, the nominal value. We're smart enough to see right through the numbers and focus on what really matters, our actual purchasing power. Our choices are based on what we can get, not the number written on the bill. Okay, so of course economists have a super technical sounding term for this. We say that the demand function is, get ready for it, homogeneous of degree zero. I know, I know it sounds incredibly complicated, but all it means, literally, all it means is that if you multiply all the prices and your income by the same number, your demand stays exactly the same. It's just the fancy formal way of describing our chocolate bar example. All right, section three, the mathematical proof. We get the idea intuitively, right? The chocolate bar example makes perfect sense. But to get top marks, you gotta prove it with the math. That's what the examiners are really looking for. And the whole entire proof, it all comes down to showing one thing, that the consumer's budget constraint, basically their menu of affordable options, doesn't change at all. So, step one, we start with the classic budget constraint equation. It might look a little intense, but it's super simple. All it says is the price of good X times the amount you buy of good X plus the price of good Y times the amount you buy of good Y, all of that has to add up to your total income, which we call M. That's it. This equation just draws a line that represents every single combination of stuff you can possibly afford. Okay, step two. Now let's do exactly what the question asks. We're going to increase all the prices and the income by the exact same proportion. We'll use a Greek letter for this proportion, lambda. Don't let it scare you, it's just a placeholder. It could be 2 for doubling, 1.5 for a 50% increase, whatever. As you can see, we've just popped that lambda next to each price and the income. And now for step 3. This is just a little bit of high school algebra, but watch. This is the magic move. See how lambda is in both terms on the left side of the equation? Well, that means we can just factor it out. We pull it outside the parentheses, just like this. It seems like a tiny step, but this is what cracks the whole thing wide open. And for the final reveal, step four, we've got a lambda on both sides of the equation. So what can we do? We just divide both sides by it. They cancel out. And what are we left with? Take a look. It is the exact same budget constraint we started with. This is the big aha moment. The math proves without a doubt that the consumer situation, their set of choices, is completely identical. Nothing has actually changed. So let's just connect all the dots here. What does this actually mean? 
Well, number one, the math just proved that the budget constraint, the list of things you can afford, is totally unchanged. Number two, we assume your tastes, your preferences, what you like, haven't changed either. So think about it. If what you can buy hasn't changed, and what you want to buy hasn't changed, why would your final decision change? It wouldn't. Your optimal choice stays put. And that means the quantity you demand for any good has to remain exactly the same. It's a clean, logical argument. Okay, awesome. We've got the theory down, we've got the proof, but now for the really practical part. How do you take all this and turn it into a top scoring exam answer? Let's lay out a six-step blueprint that will get you there. All right, here is your six-step checklist for the perfect answer. First, you're gonna lead with the big idea. State the principle of no money illusion or homogeneity of degree zero right up front. Second, lay down the math, write out that budget constraint. Third, show your work. Walk them through the algebraic proof we just did step by step. Fourth, and this is crucial, connect the math back to the theory. Explain why an unchanged budget line means an unchanged choice. Fifth, it never hurts to mention that a diagram would illustrate this perfectly. And finally, sixth, wrap it all up with a clear one-sentence conclusion. Follow that structure and you're golden. Okay, let's put on our examiner hats for a minute. What separates a good answer from a great one? What are they really looking for when they're grading this? Knowing this is the secret to getting those top tier marks. Just look at this breakdown. An average answer might correctly say something about money illusion. And that's okay, but it's missing the proof, the rigor. The excellent answer, the one that gets you the best grade, it does three things perfectly. It names the principle, it shows the flawless mathematical proof, and then this is the key. It explains the link between that proof and the consumer's final choice. That proof isn't just extra credit, it's the absolute game changer. So, you've mastered this concept, what's next? If you really want to make sure your foundation in consumer theory is rock solid, here are a few things you should definitely dig into. First, you'll want to explore other properties of demand functions. You've got things like Walras's law, which is just a fancy way of saying people usually spend all their money, and the Slitsky equation, which is a super cool tool for breaking down price effects. Next, check out duality. It's like learning to see the same problem in 3D instead of 2D, really powerful stuff. But honestly, the most important thing, practice, practice, practice. You have to work through these problems until the logic just becomes automatic. And that's really what it all comes down to, isn't it? This question might seem small and specific, but the ideas inside it, rationality, budget constraints, making the best possible choice, I mean, that's the absolute bedrock of microeconomics. You master these fundamentals and you're setting yourself up for success across the board. Thanks for joining me on this deep dive and keep up the amazing work.